Welcome again. Right now we're at John chapter 16, verses 5 through 15. The true signs of the Holy Spirit. You know, there are a lot of people who think they have the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of people who believe they have the Holy Spirit. I know a man who said that he researched tens of thousands of different Christian denominations, saying, look at all of these different Christian denominations, and they're divided over so many things, so many different points of view. Is there anything they have in common here? And he said, you know, that he found that they have one thing in common. They all claim to be led by the Spirit of God. Isn't that something? How can somebody be led by the Spirit of God <laughs> divided into tens of thousands? They say over 40,000 denominations. I mean, I've witnessed it myself. I've witnessed two different people, two different preachers who both are proclaimed or acclaimed or, you know, at least both believe that they're led by the Spirit of God, that they hear the Spirit of God, and they both argue over the same point, saying, well, the Spirit of God told me this. The other one said, no, the Spirit of God told me something completely contrary to you. So we need to know what the real deal is here, that we need to know the real from the fake, okay? We need to know the false from the true Spirit, okay? This is why I say this: these are the signs the true signs of the Holy Spirit. Let's read it. Verse 5, Jesus said, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I have told you these things, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the counselor won't come to you. You know, I used to always think, you know, and it's so easy to, to think to yourself, hey, you know what, wouldn't it be awesome to live, you know, 2,000 years ago, you know, when Jesus walked this earth, you would go there, you'd listen to Jesus teach, you would you'd see his physical appearance, you'd hear his, his voice, and wouldn't that, you know, just be awesome to see his miracles and to ask him questions personally? Wouldn't that be awesome? But Jesus said here that that point of view is not necessarily a good point of view because he said it's to your advantage that he goes away that he's not here because he he sends the spirit of god if it wasn't for him leaving the spirit of god wouldn't come in the way that that the spirit of god came okay the counselor the paracletos the helper the comforter let's read on but if I go, he said, I will send him to you. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin. Oh, well, this is quite the point here because there are a lot of preachers out there today. There are a lot of Christians out there today who proclaim themselves to be, you know, spirit filled or listen, you know, people who hear uh, and follow the spirit. But how many of them actually preach conviction of sin? Hmm? Some people say, well, no, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's not my job to convict people of sin. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict people of sin. Well, Jesus said also, we, read, we just read that back in, in John chapter 14. It's the Holy Spirit's job to remind you of the teachings of Jesus. So if you don't convict people of sin, if you don't preach against sin, because you think that it's the Holy Spirit's job and, and somehow the Holy Spirit is not supposed to use your mouth, then you better not, preacher, I'm talking to you, pastor, priest, I'm talking to you, bishop, I'm talking to you, you better not remind anybody about the teachings of Jesus either. I mean, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. I mean, let's, let's not have a double standard here. Oh, you, 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 you remind them of the teachings of Jesus, at least the teachings that make you feel good, at least the feel-good teachings of Jesus. You remind them. You preach. But you don't preach against sin. Remember, Jesus said, John 7, 7, that the world hates him because he testifies that its deeds are evil. Pastor, priest, bishop, church leader, Christian, if you follow Jesus, you're supposed to take Jesus as your example. If you preach the way Jesus preached, you're supposed to testify that the deeds of the world are evil, that its works are evil. 
You're supposed to convict people of sin, at least condemn their sin, at least identify it, point it out, call it out. Okay, of course we're supposed to do it in the right spirit. However, look at Jesus. He angered so many people. You know, one preacher said, if Jesus preached the way the preachers today preach, he would never have been crucified. Good point. You think about it, how many people, seems like almost everybody, almost everybody, come time for him to be condemned by, you know, in, by Pilate, they're all crying out, crucify him. Why such hatred? Why? Jesus said it. The world hates me because I testify its deeds are evil. He did a lot of condemning of sin, hypocrisy, and all kinds of, all kinds of things like that. Calling people whitewashed tombs, even calling a, you know, a non-Jewish woman a dog. That's just the way. That's that's, hey, that's what it says. Calling people sons of hell, sons, brood of vipers. You come from the family of snakes. You look good on the outside, whitewashed tomb, but on the inside you're full of dead, filthy, stinking, rotten flesh. That's what Jesus said to people. <laughs> That's showing the love of Jesus. You know, I got to somehow sometimes chuckle to myself because other times, I mean, it really, it's a serious thing. It's a sad thing how far the church has fallen today. But you got people going around today. Well, you got you to gotta show them the love of Jesus. You got to preach, you got to preach love, okay? You got to show sinners the love of Jesus. You got to, you got to you know, preach love and they will come to Jesus. You just got to love them into, into the kingdom. You got to pray for them. Did Jesus do that? Did Jesus say to the Pharisees, Oh, Pharisees, let me just pray for you. Oh, Father, will you just draw these people? That's what, how these people would pray today. He condemned them. He, he just, he called them out to say the least. <laughs> oh, he got them angry. He didn't care about their feelings. Really, he didn't. The true Spirit of God and those who preach by the true Spirit of God convict the world of sin. Listen, if you go to church, if you go to meetings, if you go to concerts, if you go to any kind of Christian gathering at all, and you don't have anybody there condemning sin, calling out the sins of the world or the sins of the, the, hypo, the hypocrisy of some so-called believers. If you, if you don't have that, do not go around saying, I'm hearing from the Spirit of God. Jesus said the Spirit of God convicts the world of sin. Let's read it again. Verse 8, when he has come, that's the Spirit of God has come, he will convict the world of sin. How would he do that? The same way as he, te he, he teaches people, he reminds people of the teachings of Jesus. It's the same way how he glorifies Jesus. You know, we got these, these bands up there. I mean, these Christian bands anymore. And they say, oh, they're so full of the Spirit of God because they glorify Jesus. And, and we know the Spirit, you know, it's the Spirit of God that glorifies Jesus. And we're just glorifying Jesus by the Spirit of God. Oh, Jesus, we praise you. We love you. Oh, Jesus, you're so wonderful. We love you so much. Oh, the love of Jesus, the love of God. But when it comes to convicting anybody of sin, oh, no, no, that's not me. That's not for me to judge. That's for God to judge. That's the, Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit's job. Wait a second. You're up there preaching and you're up there singing and glorifying Jesus. Isn't that the Holy Spirit's job? Jesus said that the Spirit of God will glorify him. Why don't you put down your instruments? Why don't you sh basically shut up? Put down the microphone, stop singing, and sit, in, sit down. Actually, go back and sit in the back row of the auditorium and just let the Holy Spirit glorify Jesus. Because that's the way you treat it when it comes to convicting the world of sin, right? Isn't that how you do it? Just being honest here. Honest question. Don't be hypocritical. Don't have a double standard apply the same thing right across the board. Jesus went on to say that 
the Spirit of God convicts the world about sin, about righteousness, okay? So here again, what does it mean to convict the world about righteousness? Well, it means to convince them what is right, what's wrong. Today, especially today, we have so many people who don't even know what's right and wrong. To them, what's right is whatever makes them feel good. Yeah, and what's wrong is what hurts their feelings. But they don't know that they're not even in the right place to begin with. What hurts their feelings is the truth. So they condemn the truth. We need to have preachers in pulpits. We need to have priests. We need to have bishops, church leaders, even Sunday school teachers teaching people about righteousness. What does God say about being right? That's what righteousness is. What is right in God's sight? What's wrong in God's sight? How can we know? We read the scriptures. Open up the scriptures. Start with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Oh, yes, yes, yes. There's lots of, lots of righteousness pre preached about in the book of Leviticus. May I remind you, the book of Leviticus is full of the word of God. And the word of God, according to Psalm 119, is forever settled in heaven. It doesn't say... Oh, well, the word of God, it just comes just for a season until Jesus comes. And then, well, Jesus just replaces it all. No, the word of God is forever settled in heaven. In fact, isn't it strange? Actually, it's not strange that the so-called Old Testament of the typical Protestant Bible ends in the book of Malachi when God said, him, you know, himself, God said himself. In his own words. And he's saying this to the Protestant circle. Okay. I am the Lord. I change not. A lot of Christians, they think that God changed. Oh, we got the Old Testament God. We got the New Testament God. That is Martianism. Okay. That is from the age old heresy of Martian. Okay. Marcion. Some people call him Marcion. Some people call him Martian. That's another whole subject all by itself. But let's not go into the heresy of Martianism. The God of the so-called Old Testament is the God of the so-called New Testament. There's no difference. No difference whatsoever. Different covenant, or we got a renewed covenant, not a different word not a different law. God's law is a reflection of him. Get that. God's law is God's word, which is his character. It's a reflection of him. The Torah is a reflection of God. God never changes. He has no need to change. He has no need to upgrade. He has no, he has no need to update himself. He knew the end from the beginning, right from the beginning. Okay. He does what's right, right from the very beginning. He doesn't need to correct himself or update himself or upgrade himself. He's God. He's God. Okay. So the word of God is the Torah. The Torah is the word of God. And it's forever, forever, forever. That's how you know what's right and wrong. Read the Bible. Simple. Very, very simple. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of righteousness through my tongue, through your tongue. If you preach the truth and you preach the, it, the guidelines, the instructions, the laws, the rules that our God, that our Father has set before us. It also says here that, that the Holy Spirit convicts the world about judgment. Consider, you know the old um, sermon of Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. You know, back in 1741, we had Jonathan Edwards who was preaching sinners in the hands of an angry God. Angry God! And this was fueling the great awakening in America. Quite a contrast to what we have today. We have preachers and you know, priests and church leaders and Christians preaching sinners in the hands of a loving God, fueling the great apostasy. 
the corruption that we're seeing right now in society. Where's the fear of God? Most people don't have it. And the Bible says that's just the beginning of wisdom. If you don't have the fear of God, which most, by far, most people don't, then you even haven't, you haven't even begun to be wise. And this is what God said. Wisdom according to God, not wisdom according to this world. Verse 9, about sin because they don't believe in me. Now, this is the thing. You see, a lot of Christians say, well, the only sin is just not believing in Jesus. And, and, and they so water down the whole idea of what believing in Jesus is, what it means, what it entails. First of all, let's go back to the origin here. Jesus was a Jew, 100%, in a Jewish culture, 100%, okay? Speaking to Jewish men, 100% men, 100% Jews, okay? In that context, he's a rabbi. To believe in a rabbi means that you hang on his every word. You are totally indebted to him. You are, in, you are totally immersed in his teachings. You practice what he preaches. Keep in mind what Jesus preached was Torah. Okay? Some of you might say, uh-oh, does not compute, does not compute. Hey, Jesus never, ever said anything against Torah. More or less, he just clarified it. He just he just clarified and sorted out some of the misinterpretations that some of the re religious people had about Torah back in his day. He not only taught Torah, he drove Torah deeper in people's lives. You have heard it said, you know, if you do this, I say, if you even think it. Okay, he didn't, he did not water it down. He actually, he, he actually drove it even deeper in people's lives. So to believe in a rabbi means to completely entrust yourself over to him. That means that you must completely follow him. Do what he did. Do what he does. Follow him. Take his example and take it very, very seriously. By the way, Jesus obeyed Torah 100%. If he didn't, he, was, he would be a sinner and not a savior. So that's what it means to believe in Jesus means to be completely given over to God. Completely sacrifice yourself. Sacrifice your will, your feelings on the altar and let God control your life. It doesn't matter what you feel because what you feel can change. It matters what God said. And God's instructions and His rules for your life is what matters. To believe in Jesus is to go by that. Sin is is according to 1 John, if, if anybody should know what sin is, should be the closest disciple to Jesus, John. Jesus' closest friend, John. He said, 1 John 3, 4, sin is transgression of the Torah. Hello. Sin is transgression of the law. I know some people may say, well, that, uh, that, uh, that's talking about man's law. That's talking about a different law. There's only one law, okay, in, in this culture, in the minds of the disciples, in the minds of the holiest men that was that ever walked on this earth, there's only one law. There's only one God, one baptism, one Lord, one law. Of course, it's God's law. Verse 10, about righteousness, because I'm going to my Father, and you won't see me anymore. Now, that's that's to prove that Jesus was a very righteous, righteous man, that he was taken up like Enoch. That's what he was saying. That's what he's saying here. Because what he did and what he said was righteous. In other words, what he did, how he lived, what he taught was right. And proof of that is he's going to be taken up to his father. He's going to ascend to his father right before the eyes of the disciples and many, many others. Verse 11, about judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. Verse 12, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. In other words, Jesus said, there's lots of things I, I've got to tell you, but it's just too much for you to understand right now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak. 
He will declare to you things that are coming. Very, very, very interesting. Here again is another sign. We got many signs here. We got signs from John chapter 14 that the Holy Spirit will teach you. The Holy Spirit will remind you of the teachings of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit will convict people of their sin. The Holy Spirit will convict people of righteousness. The Holy Spirit will convict people of judgment, the fear of God. And the Holy Spirit will speak about what is to come. You know what? If you get really, really, really close to God, God will show you things to come. He will whisper in your ear what's going to happen in your future. He's going to prepare you for things that you're about to go through. He will lead you down ways. He will teach you about things to come. That's how you know the Father's with you. That's how you know the Father loves you. When the Father shows you what is to come. Very, very, very important. Very, very, very special. When the Father loves you so much that He leads you and, and prepares you and shows you and tells you of things to come next week, today, next year, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. Very, very special thing. Verse 14, he will glorify me for he will take from what is mine and will declare it to you. All things that the father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will declare it to you. The Textus Receptus says he will take instead of takes. He will take of mine and declare it to you. What an awesome passage of scripture we just read. Once again, these are signs of the Holy Spirit. There are so many people who think they have the Holy Spirit. There are so many people who think they hear from the Holy Spirit. Hey, if you do, the Holy Spirit will teach you things, will remind you of the teachings of Jesus. If you're not reminded of the teachings of Jesus, and by the way, the Holy Spirit will drive you back to the Bible, drive you back to the Word. How else is He going to remind you of the teachings of Jesus? If it wasn't for the written teachings of Jesus, who would know about them? I say that because there are so many people that think that, oh, we don't go by the book no more. We just go by the Spirit. Oh, no. The Spirit takes you to the book, reminds you of the book. Okay? He will convict the world of sin. He will convict the world of righteousness. He will show you what sin is. A lot of people don't know what sin is. A lot of people don't know what righteousness is. They got their own idea of righteousness. And it's so easy for people to confuse the law of the land right now. I'm talking about the law of your land right now. Secular law with God's law. It's so easy to confuse it. Let's not confuse it. What God said is right is right. doesn't matter what the, land, the law of the land says right now. What God says is wrong is wrong. It doesn't matter what the law of the land says right now. The law of the land is just a product of men. Okay? And God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, will convict you of judgment and of things to come and will glorify Jesus. Again, so many people would say, well, it's not my job to convict people of sin. Yes, it is. It's your job to dedicate your mouth to the Holy Spirit and say, oh, Spirit of God, use my mouth to convict my mother, my brother, my sister, my, my son, my daughter of sin, my friend of sin, the general public of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So I pray that God gives you boldness. Everyone that is listening to me right now, every one of you that has gotten this far in the teaching, if you've gotten this far in the teaching, I know you, you're hungry. I know you want the truth. And my prayer is for you, that God would bless you with boldness, great boldness to preach what should be preached, to live in a way that you should live, to be a great example to your neighbor. And may the Spirit of God lead you to the Scriptures and just give you a great hunger for Him. Because blessed are those who hunger. You will be filled. Blessings.